Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Srikant Patanis. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm, in, uh, I'm a software engineer in eBay, and uh, I work in the cloud engineering team. And um, we are uh, one of the teams that uh, we're trying to internalize Kubernetes at eBay. So um, I, I know you guys are just back from lunch. I'll try not to put you guys to sleep. Um, so before we get started about uh, the journey of what, what we did uh, networking-wise. Uh, let, uh, let me try to set the stage as to why we did what we did and uh, what were the outcomes of them and uh, issues and how we dealt with them and things of that sort. So, uh, well, we all know networking is inherently hard. Uh, depending on whom you talk to, you get different, dif different degrees of uh, uh, different, thi different things for different answers for, for this thing. And, uh, um, you will have uh, different issues that they talk about. So uh, we started our Kubernetes journey um, late 2014, early 2015 uh, timeframe. By that time, eBay had gone through um, multiple generations of cloud, private cloud, and uh, we had a pretty big OpenStack uh, setup. So we're talking about 100, 100K or so instances um, scale-wise, and uh, and obviously, through this cloud journey, networking models also had evolved, and we had uh, different uh, zones or different islands of how things were set up and uh, how things were running. Um, of them, uh, two are primarily two were primarily important as far as OpenStack goes, uh, and, and uh, uh, we done Kubernetes on OpenStack. And uh, those were one with uh, SDN and one with uh, pure L3 routed. Uh, models. And apart from this, uh, we also had to consider multi-tenancy uh, to ensure that everything worked alongside each other well, and also had to run uh, with uh, the legacy stuff that was already in production. Uh, so with all of that in mind, and uh, um, we are also talking about a, lot, a pretty big um, physical hardware, physical load balancers, and um, uh, physical switches, and uh, things of that sort. So one of the earliest models that we, we tried out was um, very similar to what uh, de facto or default Kubernetes uh, uh, networking model is. So <laughs> I remember this, that we were uh, looking at all the documentation, early 2015, I think. Uh, and there was, uh, there's this networking document uh, on GitHub about how, how Kubernetes networking differs from Docker. It's, uh, IP is routed, IP is per pod, and uh, slash 24 is routed to, to minions, and uh, all, of that all of that stuff. And there's this one, um, one sentence somewhere that said, the, well, all, of the under, uh, all of the routing and other stuff is assumed to be taken care of by the cloud provider. <laughs> and that, that statement is so compound, and we found out that as we uh, went on with our journey. So here, uh, what we did was to try to be as close to that that original uh, setup was. Um, each of, this is uh, on OpenStack SDN, and um, each of the minions here uh, had uh, a, uh, the default network that that uh, the zone provided. That's the blue uh, network that you're seeing here. And but apart from that, there's uh, another network that was a private network that was dedicated per node um, that it was booted with. This is, a, this is a private interface. It's connected to a private network, which is connected to a cluster uh, router, cluster dedicated router. And uh, all of the pods would come up on this network. And apart from that, on the host, uh, we also had uh, our own network plugin. Um, we call it testnet, um, and, uh, which, would, which would bring up the pods on an OBS bridge. So we also had... Uh, experimented with OBS uh, through our OpenStack journey and had gotten comfortable with it. And uh, we decided to go with OBS on the box uh, back then, uh, thinking that we'll be able to use it for various other things like segmentation or um, things of that sort. So <clears throat> that's how a node looks like. Uh, uh, OBS bridge, pods on it, and a private network. This is uh, pretty good, but uh, all of the pods are in private network. So to get to any pod, you would have to have something that can route from outside. So for that, we had uh, floating IPs. 
which would, which would uh, be gotten from a ramp network or from a routable network and that are associated with each of the pods or on uh, each of the VMs on which the pods were running. This um, in itself, again, is again a management issue. So when our pods move, there's so much churn sometimes when uh, uh, pods move there, you have to appropriately delete the ports and stuff in Neutron, update the Neutron properly, otherwise it's unhappy and then nothing works. So that, that was uh, roughly the issue. It's, it's slightly complicated um, and, uh, and need, needed a lot of operational expertise. So the next, uh, so the other, other island, to, so to call, was the uh, L3 routing model, where uh, it was pure L3 um, um, IPs routed to TARS. So here in this model, we, um, uh, we got some of, the, some of the hardware earmarked for us and uh, got some uh, IP capacity routed to these TARS. And our, our cluster bootstrapping scripts would basically uh, allocate smaller chunks of uh, this subnet to each of the minions. This was the days back where Kube, uh, Kube controller or Kube controller manager would not handle this uh, distribution of uh, uh, minion subnets. So we used uh, NIPAP, the open source um, um, IPAM, um, internalized it a little bit, and uh, got it working. Uh, and nothing changed on the node. OBS still and testnet and everything would work. Uh, IPs are routed, but the issue with this is uh, if there are any nodes that are running hot or falling short of IPs, you cannot move them dynamically. You, it was all statically allocated. You'll have to either take on the issue of ma uh, making the um, scheduler aware of all of the um, IP space and not schedule on those boxes or or do something else. So it was, it was difficult. I mean, the, there was uh, wasted capacity. I mean, you, you could not use uh, capacity optimally. So this got us thinking. Um, and by the way, this was all done through the cluster bootstrapping scripts uh, originally we wrote, um, when this would be uh, run at the time of bringing up minions or master or, or the cluster itself. And um, this got us thinking, and uh, and. Uh, we were wondering what, what to do and how to, one, this was two different approaches for depending on how, the, how our network was set up and that it was operationally difficult to handle. And two, it was, it was not ideal in either case. Um, so we switched to this, um, where we said, okay, let's abstract out the network boundaries from the nodes where instead of going, instead of having this subnet per node and things like that, let's abstract out and come up with some other thing. So that aggregation of arbitrary number of nodes or arbitrary number of uh, um, network capacity it was what, what we call as network scope. So basically, network scope is an aggregation of one or many hosts, and uh, IP blocks or IP capacities assigned to this network, uh, this network scope. So this is... Um, a declarative model of SARTs, which was in line with Kubernetes, so network scopes would be created, IP capacity would be procured for this network scopes, and a cluster would be built in this, uh, this network scope. And uh, <clears throat> this also worked fairly well with all of the, all of the legacy stuff. We would, uh, it, it would uh, be on, on par with whatever we had already. So let's take a closer look at what, how that actually works. So there is a central IPAM controller. Um, uh, it it uh, is responsible for allocating IPs to pods. And it manages allocation pools. Allocation pools are associated with the network scopes that, that I was just mentioning. So each of the node, when it comes up, belongs to an, a network scope. And whenever a pod is placed on that node, IPAM knows which allocation pool to pick from when allocating IPs. And it's like any other controller, it's master elected and runs on the cluster and allocates IPs to pods. So let's look at the flow of how it actually works. So the cluster admin, before creating the cluster, would go and create these network scopes, allocation, and associate them to allocation pools. And uh, Kubernetes nodes, when they're booted, are associated with, this, with these network scopes. And, uh, when a pod is spun up, 
cube scheduler will place it appropriately on any node, whichever has the capacity. And IPAM now knows, by looking at the pod, can derive which network scope the pod lives in and can allocate an IP out of uh, the allocation pool that's associated with the network scope. And allocations are done by, uh, as a form of annotations on pods, so uh, pods are annotated. Now, uh, with this, we also had to change the network plugin that, that's on the box. So the network plugin earlier uh, would, was all inside the box, would, uh, would delegate much of the stuff to Docker, but now network plugin would wait for these annotations to arrive. Once arrived, it would uh, wire the container appropriately on the box. And uh, with that, uh, the host, the networking on the host had to change a little bit, like I was explaining earlier here. Um, the OBS bridge is still there. Uh, containers are still hanging off, off the OBS bridge. And uh, it's connected to the host namespace via a VETH. Uh, that's the PB device thing. And uh, since our, um, our core networking does not do L3 to host, and it's still routed, uh, it's still routed to the tar, uh, we have to do our proxy to be able to move uh, pods amongst the hosts. And also, apart from that, uh, thing to note is that when pods are moving fast, uh, you might wonder how it will resolve to old things. So we do a gratuitous ARP when a pod comes up to show that here's uh, the pod and here's the IP for it. That's, uh, that's how our, um, that's how our current model works. And uh, it's, uh, as I was saying, it's completely in line with the declarative models of Kubernetes. And, uh, um, is uh, working fairly well with, with uh, all of our clusters, including the production clusters that's, that we have right now. So switching gears here a little bit, um, apart from that, uh, we did a few enhancements or a few uh, modifications to uh, f some of the other components that are, that are there in Kubernetes, um, one of them being the service controller. Fundamental, or uh, the default way of service controller um, is, uh, that it would route, sorry, uh, whenever a, a service of type load balancer is created, uh, if there's a cloud provider integration, it would create um, VIPs and members uh, underneath it, except the members are not pods directly, but the hosts are the minions in the cluster, which would mean that there, there could be one more hop in the data path for when the packet arrives, so that it would bounce off of one of the hosts, QProxy would then route it to the, to the concern pod. So to eliminate that, what we did was a slight modification to its functioning where we added pods directly as members um, to, to, uh, to a pool or to a neutron web. So the rest of the functionality is same. Uh, packet arrives, goes through web directly to the uh, pod. All right, the next interesting thing that we took on was ingress. Um, so eBay's, um, eBay's model or uh, eBay's app topology is application topology is uh, slightly different. It was what we see uh, here. So each of the regional deployments of an application get a regional VIP, which are basically members for the next level of uh, VIPs, With the, these next level of VIPs are called web tier uh, load balancers or web tier VIP. So these are, um, these have an affinity to, to the regional web, but also are aware of a failover scenario where they can go to, they can go across regions um, in case of a total regional failure and things like that. So these are aggregated again on top with uh, GTM, Global Traffic Manager, and um, it's uh, Smart DNS, which can um, either give you uh, the closest WIP, which is geographically closest uh, to the client, or can give all of, the, all of the WIPs underneath it so that the client can take care of uh, deciding where to go. So our first ingress attempt was to actually realize this uh, topology. So, the ingress controller um, does exactly that. When an when ingress spec is defined, uh, the controller goes through, uh, goes through each of these, 
each of the stages. That is, first it'll go, go to the LBMS and configure the load balancer uh, that, is, um, that is supposed to do the web tier load balancing. And the services which were design, defined in the ingress uh, spec the, will be the app tier or the application level WIPs. So on top of that, it builds the web tier load balancers. On, on top of the web tier load balancers, it builds the GTM or the global traffic manager and uh, associates um, DNS with, with, the, with the web tier load balancer IPs. Um, that, that'd be the omg.ebay.com we saw in the previous slide. So that, that's currently what, how it works uh, as far as ingress goes. And the, we're, we're looking to uh, enhance this to have uh, cross-color cross or cross-region deployments to be able to um, add more, um, add a, a global federation or cross-regional uh, federation to, to this. And another, another interesting thing that we did recently was the um, DNS, Cube2 DNS controller. Most, uh, most of our users were constantly asking for what's the, if, if I create a service, is there a name that I can associate this with? So to do, to do that, we, uh, we have a small controller that uh, looks at services of type load balancer and creates DNS records for it uh, of this, this format that we see here. And uh, this enables user to have any, uh, have any uh, custom annotation and have a C name for it uh, uh, that is routable not just inside the cluster from anywhere inside the eBay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so that was the brief talk. and. Um, what, what we are looking to do in future is, uh, as I was saying, we are uh, looking to do um, immediate concern, immediate uh, things that are coming up are network policy enforcement to have uh, uh, wider segmentation, uh, better uh, management of our clusters themselves, and, um, that, uh, and uh, globally federated ingress. That is, ability to have uh, deployments across clusters, but uh, be able to route from the same ingress point. And we are also looking to manage these via uh, software-defined load balancers um, and uh, uh, have them uh, uh, fed be federated. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you.